If you've made it this far, we hope you've enjoyed the video. For this next part, we'll do a quick breakdown of each day on the Inker Trail with Alpaca Expeditions. We'll also talk about some of our favorite gear we brought with us on the trek, as well as some of our best tips and suggestions for the trail in general. So the Inca Trail with Alpaca Expeditions is four days and three nights, and we're gonna break down each day here. We're gonna talk about the time, distance, and difficulty for each day. So on day one, they have to pick up everyone in your group. So our pickup time was between five and 5.15. So we ended up waking up around 4.30, and then we had to be ready at the door for them to come grab us between five and 5.15. After that, there's a bus that takes you down to Oyotetambo. Uh, where you have your first breakfast and that's where you kind of meet everybody and all the other groups that are going with alpaca expeditions are there as well. We will say that the food is probably not a good representation of what it's going to be like on the rest of the trail for probably several different reasons. Yeah, so you end up meeting at the porter's house, so you don't have your full culinary staff there yet. So our breakfast was some mixed fruit, scrambled eggs, but it just felt like there wasn't quite enough for everybody to go around. But like Joseph said, it definitely wasn't a good representation of what your trip is gonna be like. And there's a lot of groups crammed into this one area. So it just felt very crowded, not very well put together. There's only one bathroom for a lot of people at that one stop. Um, so again, it just wasn't really a good first impression, but the check is definitely worth it and it got better from there. So after that, the bus will take you to kilometer 82, which is where the Inca Trail starts. Um, and this day is broken down into pretty much six hours of hiking. It's about 14 kilometers in total, which includes about 4.5 hours up to your lunch spot and then a two hour incline to your campsite. Yeah, I felt like the first day was pretty easy. It started off at a very slow pace. There was a lot of opportunities to take pictures, so I thought it was really nice, um, especially because both of us had a little bit of altitude sickness, so it was nice to go at a slower pace and just take our time. So the day is rated as moderately difficult day, is what they put on the brochure. I guess some notes that we had are definitely acclimate. It's probably our best note. We definitely didn't do enough of that. There was a little bit of altitude sickness. I know for me, it was a nauseous feeling and I didn't really have an appetite for about a day and a half. Yeah, I also felt like it was very hard to breathe. I couldn't catch a breath at all. I also had some nausea and some issues with my stomach. So I think the more time you can give yourself to acclimate before you actually start your hike, the better. And that's acclimating in Cusco, not in anywhere else in Peru. So for those who don't know, Cusco is actually at a higher altitude than Machu Picchu. Uh, I, don't, I think it's about 11,000 feet. So after that, you go to sleep, you crash pretty early, everybody's pretty exhausted from the day and wiped out. We didn't really have any trouble getting to sleep that night. Day two, our wake up time was about 4.50 in the morning. It was a pretty early start. This day has about 11 hours total of hiking, which includes 16 kilometers, a four hour incline, which is broken up at the two hour mark. So the top is called Dead Woman's Pass, and that's at about 13,779 feet, which is the highest you'll be on the Inca Trail. So after that, it's two hours decline to your lunch, followed by two hours incline to an archeological site, and then another two hour decline before you finally get to your campsite for that night. So it is a very long day and it's rated as a challenging day. Yeah, so there was a lot of anticipation around this day. I know we were all talking about it at dinner the night before. Not only is it a really long day, but it's a really physically challenging day. I think the morning started off, we felt really good. We felt a lot better. Our altitude sickness was getting better, so we felt really, really good. I think probably the hardest part was after lunch. We had really full bellies, and then we were hiking another, what, like four hours until we got to a resting point. So it's just a really, really long day. Um, I think if we had any tips for that day in general, just hydration is so important. We also did this trick of changing out our socks at that long lunch that we had. That was really refreshing because we knew we were gonna continue to hike for a long time the rest of the day. So that was really nice to refresh our socks at that point. So every morning you have a set wake up time, but it's typically 30 to 40 minutes before you have to be in the breakfast tent. And the way that you're woken up is by one of your porters offering coca tea, which was really nice and relaxing way to wake up in the morning and it helps with altitude sickness. So one thing that was really comforting for me in general, I wasn't sure how 
physically challenging hiking for this many hours each day was going to be, but our guides did a really good job of encouraging us along the way. And not only that, but also encouraging us to go at our own pace, which I think was so important. In our group, we had a lot of fast hikers, so it was nice for those of us who wanted to go at a little bit of a slower pace to be encouraged to do so, take breaks when we wanted to, take pictures when we wanted to. And it was kind of a bonus for us because a guide kind of hung back with us. We got to learn a lot about the culture and the terrain and the animals in the areas that we were, so that was really nice. And we got to get to know our guides really well that way. Another thing that's really fun along the trail that I guess I wasn't expecting is that there are a lot of different archaeological sites and we took the time to stop at each one, sit down, take a break, and then our guides went into great detail about the history of that site. So it's a really good way to get to know the Inca Trail and the culture surrounding it and it was nice to have that extra break. So that second day after your 11 hours of hiking, you wind up at your campsite for the evening. It's got a great view of the Salcante Mountains. I liked that campsite the most. It had a really pretty view. We were very secluded from the other groups. I don't think there were as many groups sharing the restrooms. So all in all, I really love that campsite the best. On day three, we had a wake up time of about 5.50 in the morning. It's a little bit of a later start. This day, you're supposed to hike about five hours for 10 kilometers. It's 1.5 hours on an up and down trek, followed by 2.5 hours of a steep decline to where you get to another archeological site. And it's another about 30 minutes till you get to your lunch. And it's also your campsite for the evening. It's rated on the brochure as an easy day. I felt like the hiking part of this day was pretty easy. The steep downhill was pretty steep, so we took our time. And then we got to the campsite, I feel like it was around 2.30, which was so early. And it was really nice to have some downtime to take a nap, refresh, before we started lunch. It's noted here that this is definitely one of the most scenic days on the trail. Lots of picture opportunities, and, and we stopped a lot with the guide, and he was taking pictures for everyone, so that was nice. This is also where we had our alpaca sightings, which was pretty cool. We also had great views of the snow-capped mountains on this day. After we had a nice long break, we did something really special and had a cooking class. So our entire lunch tent was set up with cutting boards, steak knives. We all pitched in and helped chop vegetables. The chef taught the class. He was very hands-on with all of us. We also learned how to cook steak in a wok over an open fire. So it was really fun. We all pitched in to make the lunch that day. It was also really cute. We had guacamole for lunch that day and it had alpaca chips. So this third day on the Inca Trail also happened to be Courtney's 32nd birthday, which I had told our guide ahead of time. The chef actually had prepared something pretty special for her. So we woke up, had breakfast, and then the guide had us close our eyes for what felt like a really long time. He told us the porters had a surprise for all of us. And when we opened our eyes, there was a huge two-tiered carrot cake. It was beautifully decorated, had happy birthday and my name on it, as well as some matches for candles. So it was really sweet. Everybody sang me happy birthday, and then we all got to have cake for breakfast. The cake was so good, but it was extra special because the chef woke up at least an hour and a half early to bake this cake. So at altitude, everything takes a little bit longer to cook. So he had to cook each tier for at least 30 to 45 minutes, and then he spent another 30 to 45 decorating it. So it was really special and really made my birthday. So this is also the night where it's customary to give the tips and you kind of decide as a group if it's something you want to do individually or something you want to pull together as a group. We decided to do it as a group. And at that time you give your tips to the porters and also the chef. We'll talk about tips more in detail later. So that night you wind up going to bed pretty early because the last day you're going to wake up extremely early for your final pass to Machu Picchu. So I think originally we were going to get up around four o'clock, but uh, once we got to our campsite, after we were there for a while, we started to see how many groups were there and going to be doing the same pass the, the next morning. Um, so our guy decided to have us wake up a little bit early. We woke up at around 3.15, I believe, so we can kind of get a head start. I think that night we actually went to sleep in our clothes just so we didn't have to do as much the next morning so we could wake up extra early. So after you wake up, get everything situated, it's just a short, about five minute hike to the gate. And that doesn't open until 5.30. So you're just waiting there until 5.30. It's still dark outside, um, but there's only a limited amount of seating. So the earlier you get there, uh, the better your chances are of getting a seat. 
instead of having to wait standing up until 5.30. So luckily we were there early enough to sit down and we got to enjoy a sack breakfast that our chef had prepared as a, a final meal. Yeah, so it's a little bit crowded. It does get a little bit chilly as well, so make sure you have your coat that day. And to go to the bathrooms, you do have to hike back to camp. So it is several minutes to use the bathrooms if you have to, but overall it was all right. We were just really glad that we got seats and didn't have to wait standing. So this day is a total of about two hours hiking, um, which is about five kilometers. You do, like I said, the five minutes to the trail gate and it takes about one hour to get to the sun gate and then one final hour of a decline to Machu Picchu. And this day is rated on the brochure as Machu Picchu unforgettable <laughs> when it comes to difficulty level. So uh, take that however you will. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure why, but it felt like we hiked faster on this day than any of the other days. I think everybody's trying to get to the sun gate as soon as possible. So everybody's hiking at a pretty quick pace. And at the sun gate, you get your first glimpse of Machu Picchu. So it's a great photo op. Right before you get to the sun gate, there's what's called the Gringo Killer. Mm -hmm. It's basically a scramble on all fours up these very steep stairs. Our guides were nice enough to hold our trekking poles and then we basically got on all fours and hiked all the way up to the top. And then shortly after that, you're at the sun gate. So when you finally get to Machu Picchu, you do have the option to check your bags for five soles. So that's another reminder to bring some coins with you. They do have restrooms there as well for two soles. They also had a restaurant that had coffee and snacks. Mm -hmm. So included with Alpaca Expeditions is a two hour guide in Machu Picchu. And after that, Alpaca Expeditions provides you with tickets on a bus to go down to Agos Calientes, uh, where you have your final lunch with the group. And then after that, you take the train to Oya Tatambo, where there will be a Alpaca Expeditions bus waiting to take you back to Cusco. Around like 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. maybe? It was, it was a little late. We were one of the last stops, so they kind of did it in reverse order. So we were about the last people to get dropped off. I think it was around between 8 and 9. So the trekking checklist on the Alpaca Expeditions brochure, it says that it recommends you bring your passport, you need that, your day pack, sleeping bag, hiking boots, trekking poles, uh, warm clothes, make sure you bring layers, wool socks, headlamps, sunscreen, camera, and extra batteries, uh, maybe a personal med kit if you have one, definitely bring insect repellent, uh, rain gear, toiletries, a small towel they recommend, a uh, camelback if you have one, and extra money for snacks and souvenirs and tips on the trek. And they recommend an extra 300 solas that you bring. So now we're gonna get into tipping. They do say that it's 100% voluntary, of course, but they suggest pulling your tips around 60 solas per order and a little more than double that for the chef. There's no suggestions for tipping the guide. That's just something you do personally at the end of the trek if you choose to do so. We will say that it's a common opinion that after trekking for several days, see an amount of work that's put into setting up camp every night and setting up your tents and just the, the weight that the porters are carrying on their backs and they're running the trails and, and the amazing food you have with the chef. It's a pretty common opinion that you're gonna want to tip more than you originally thought you were going to. I know we did. Joseph mentioned earlier just bringing some extra solas to have. Along the trail, there's several areas where there's little local shops set up and you can buy more water, Gatorade, snacks, so just make sure you have solas. So on the brochure, it also talks about what's included, uh, which is your hotel pickup, your transportation to the start of the trail, a professional English-speaking guide, your entrance fee to the Inca Trail National Park, your entrance fee to Machu Picchu, quarters to carry all the equipment, the tents, the food, the cooking gear, the dining tents, the meals, it's four breakfasts, four snacks, three lunches, three happy hours, and three dinners. They also provide pillows for you, coca tea, water, and vegetarian food option. They have an oxygen tank and first aid kit if necessary. They're supposed to have a private portable toilet uh, but because our group didn't have enough quarters, we were given the option to stay at campsites that were a little bit closer to the facilities and our group would be the one to utilize those. Yeah, normally there's about 22 quarters that follow you on the trek. We had about 16, so we were all right with foregoing the portable toilet and just being closer to the restrooms that were there. Also included is your two hour guided tour of Machu Picchu, bus tickets back down to Agus Palientes after you're finished with the guide, and then your train ticket from Oya to Tambo to Cusco. It does say not included is your last lunch in Agos Calientes. On the brochure, it also talks about rentals. Um, you can rent a sleeping bag for $20, 
uh, an inflatable sleeping pad, which we highly recommend for $15. You can also rent trekking poles for $15 per pair. And again, we recommend all three. There were some people in our group who didn't have trekking poles, but we felt like it helped us, uh, especially when you're on those steeper inclines or there's steeper declines. During the last stretch to Machu Picchu, there are some areas that are pretty slippery on the rocks. Uh, so uh, I think several times, I know I almost fell a few times and I uh, caught myself with the trekking poles. Uh, so we do recommend you get those. You might not feel like the sleeping pad is necessary, but the great thing is the porters are carrying it. By the time we got to camp, our tents were set up and the sleeping pads were already in each tent. So it was really nice to just grab our duffel bags with our sleeping bag inside and just be able to roll out our sleeping bag on top of the pad. It made camping so much more comfortable. So we really recommend getting the sleeping pad. So we found the brochure super helpful throughout the whole trek. We want to take a screenshot, we're going to post it now. We talked a little bit about the porters and the amount of stuff that they carry. The first night before the Inca Trail, you meet together at the Alpaca Expedition's office, and that's when they give you your duffel bags, so one per person. Mm -hmm. They carry a total of seven kilograms of weight, and that also includes any gear you may have rented from them. So if you rented sleeping bags or the inflatable pad, that's included in the weight. So after all that, it's about half or 3.5 kilograms of weight that you have a free space that you can give them to carry for you throughout the day. Your duffel bag is something that you won't have access to until you reach your campsite each night. So everything you want with you during the day on the Inca Trail is gonna have to be in your day pack. So obviously your water, your snacks, things that you want immediate access to. We felt like we used that weight up pretty quickly. We both brought only a couple outfits for the four days. Still, we had to take out some things to make weight. I will say that, I, I don't know, I brought way too many socks. Uh, I thought there would be a lot more opportunities to kind of break and change the socks, but we really did that like one time. So those can take up a lot of weight. So uh, bring extra socks I recommend, but not an excessive amount because you probably won't be using them. Yeah, I also brought really thick wool socks, one pair for each night. And then it turns out after I kind of refreshed, I was already clean when I put those on. So I happened to just wear the same ones every day. So just keep that in mind when you're packing. You really don't use or wear as much as you think you will. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about a few tips we have before we get into tips for the Inca Trail. We're gonna talk about a few tips we have for Peru in general, and then we'll get into our tips for the Inca Trail. We recommend if you're staying in Lima that you stay in an area called Mita Flores. We happened to pass through there and it was really lively. There were a lot of casinos, restaurants, bars, parks, People were out walking, the nightlife seemed really cool. So if you're looking for an area to stay, that's what we recommend. Also, if you have any extra time in Lima and you're thinking about taking a tour in like Paracas or Huacachina, we recommend that you pick one that focuses on the sand dunes at the Oasis. Mm -hmm. We did a day tour that had a lot of different things included and we really felt like we wish we had more time at the sand dunes in the Oasis. It was just too many small events crammed into one day and the sand dunes were definitely the funnest part. So in retrospect, we would have picked a tour that focused more on the sand dunes. Yeah, and the Oasis was its own little mini city. There were markets and places to stay and restaurants. So it seemed like a really cool, fun place to stay if you wanted to spend more time at the sand dunes. So now we're gonna share some of our tips about the Inca Trail. So our first tip is that you follow Alpaca Expeditions on Facebook. We found it really helpful there's a lot of people on there who are doing the same trek as you. There's a lot of people that talk about what to pack, where to stay. Um, it goes into great detail. And there's people who haven't done it yet and also people who have already done the trek that are responding to you. So it's a really great community and a good way to get some information while you're packing and preparing for your trek. Some of the questions that we found were asked a lot were where to stay in Cusco when you get there. and. We found that it's probably best if you stay near the Alpaca Expeditions office, which is pretty close to the Plaza de Armas, which I would say is about maybe 20 minutes away from the airport. Yeah, it was a really cute and nice plaza. There's tons of restaurants and little shops. There's also ATMs in that area. So you can really walk everywhere. So it's a really nice place to stay. I think the question we've been asked the most since coming back from the trek is how we use the bathroom or where we use the bathroom. Along the trek, there's bathroom facilities. I'd say every few hours, 
You do have to pay soles for these because they're run by locals in that village. It was typically like one to two soles to use the restroom and they did give you paper, which was nice. So just make sure you bring a lot of coins with you. At the campsites, as Joseph mentioned earlier, we did have restroom facilities. The first couple of days, they were regular toilets fully flushing. The last two days, they were squatty potties. So a lot of our uh, fellow trekkers decided or opted to use the natural bathrooms. So whichever way you go, uh, the squatty potties did flush, so that was nice. We did have several groups using them, so they get pretty dirty pretty quickly. I think a few of the facilities had um, the option to be able to shower. It's obviously a cold shower. What we found super helpful for us was dude wipes which are basically baby wipes, but they're scented and a little bit more coarse so that you can clean yourself. And I think we went through like two packs of that. Yeah, they do give you a pretty small towel. It's about the size of a small hand towel if you do opt to take a cold shower. But it was really funny. There was someone in our group that took showers and couldn't keep his towel dry in between the days. So just think about that if you are gonna take a cold shower. And most of the time that you're taking them is in the evening. So it does get pretty chilly pretty quickly. So just keep that in mind if you're thinking you're going to take this cold shower every night. Another thing a lot of people ask about is boots versus hiking shoes and that's just one of those things that uh, it's going to be personal preference whatever you're most comfortable hiking in. The Inca Trail is, is full of a lot of dirt paths and stones that are uneven so if you need a little bit more ankle support hiking boots is probably the way to go but we'll say that it's probably what you're most comfortable in. Either could be done. Also make sure if you're gonna do hiking boots that they're worn in. I know this is not the time to try new boots out. It was recommended that you also make sure that your toenails are clipped. There's a lot of steep parts where you're going down and you're on your toes and that can be pretty uncomfortable. Personally, I actually wore an extra pair of socks just for extra protection. So again, it's just a personal preference, but just make sure that those hiking boots are worn in before you hike. Another thing which we already talked about a little bit was the, renting the trekking poles, whether or not they're necessary. Again, that's just gonna be another one of those personal preference things. We found them to be very helpful, again, on those steep inclines and steep declines, which there are a ton of on the Inca Trail. Another question we get asked a lot is about the food. So besides the first breakfast that we talked about earlier, we found the food to be very plentiful. There's a good variety every day between the different types of meat, vegetables. We also had some appetizers before dinners. I think every dinner started with a soup, which was really awesome, especially because it got chilly in the evening. So most of the time you started with a soup, had several main dishes, it's all family style that you share. Usually you ended with a dessert, and then after every meal we had mint tea to help digest, which was really nice. And I will say there was someone in our group that didn't eat beef, so our chef made extra plates for her if we did have a beef dish, so that's really nice. So just make sure that you tell the group if you have any preferences but there's tons of food you will not go hungry they also provide a snack every day it's typically some kind of fruit and then a granola bar or crackers or cookies so that was really nice another thing that was talked about a lot in the Facebook group was whether you should bring snacks a lot of people said that the food was plentiful and that you don't need your own snacks I think it just depends on the person. I brought my own snacks like dried fruit and almonds and I actually ate everything I brought on top of what they provided us as well as all the meals. So for me, when I hike, I have a very high metabolism and that just gets kicked into a high gear and I just take in a lot of extra calories while I'm hiking. There were some other hikers that were the same way. They went through all the snacks that they brought as well. So I think just keep that in mind. I didn't bring a ton, but what I did bring, I did actually eat. There's also plenty of opportunities to get uh, snacks at local convenience stores. They also have coca leaves that you can buy in the convenience stores. We wound up buying some of the, the coca gummies that they had there and taking them on the trip. Another tip we had is to bring liquid IV. We bought it on Amazon. It comes in little individual packets and it's really convenient to take in the morning with your water. It gives you electrolytes and we felt really good knowing that we had that extra support in our system just in case we didn't take in as much water as we should have. 
Another tip we had is that we found it would probably be easiest if you pick a place that you're staying, whether it be at a hostel or Airbnb or hotel, you stay at the same place when you return from the trek. So I know our hostel provided us the opportunity to check our bags for free and they stored it the entire time we were on the trek. So I think probably our biggest tip for the entire trip is to acclimate, which is something we didn't take as seriously as we should have. Um, some people suggest bringing Diamox or, or getting Diamox at the local pharmacies if you can. I think we were both struck with a little bit of altitude sickness for the first day, day and a half there. So it is extremely important to acclimate if you have that opportunity to do so. So we talked a little bit about what Alpaca Expeditions suggests you to bring as far as gear goes. And now we're gonna list some of the things that we found most helpful on the trip. Obviously socks, but not in excess. Camelbacks for sure were super helpful. Some people on our group didn't have camelbacks and they were just using water bottles or multiple water bottles. It's just, again, kind of a personal preference thing. But we will say it was super convenient to be able to have your camel back in your day pack with the tube coming around. You never really had to stop hiking to hydrate or any of that. So that was super convenient. So these are our camel bags here. Mine is three liters. And mine's two liters. And we found that that was more than enough water for each day. You are given the opportunity uh, to refill at each campsite. They do boil the water before they give it to you. So usually after each meal, they would ask how much water we needed and then they would ensure that they had that much boiled to refill for us. So you don't have to worry about that. So obviously headlamps are super important to have. Uh, just something simple is good enough. So you will be needing them for early in the morning when it's still dark out. And then also when you're at your campsite at night, uh, there's oftentimes times you need to go to the restroom and it's a little bit of a trek. So it's important to have your headlamp. Another thing that we found super helpful for us was these light bulbs we got off Amazon for a couple of bucks. They're extremely light. We just put them in our pack and we were able to put those in our tent. That way we didn't have to use our headlamp while we were in there. And blind each other. So we had a guy in our group that had a metal condition and he snored. Him and his wife were nice enough to give us earplugs because the first night we had to sleep next to them. And we thought that was a really nice touch even if you weren't sleeping next to a snorer. It doesn't block out all of the sound, but it does a great job of muffling the noises going on in your campsite. So we really recommend bringing earplugs for your trip. Uh, they also recommend you bring some kind of individual first aid kit. This is just something that we bring typically when we go hiking in general or camping. I don't think we wound up using anything out of it this time except for we did use new skin, which we have in here. And we recommend that for if you're prone to blisters. And it's just a good thing to have just in case. Yeah, I had some spots on my feet that I could tell were starting to form blisters. I put that new skin on there and never developed blisters. So that was really nice. Highly recommend. One thing that's super important for me because I do not do bugs well is to bring bug spray. So there are a lot of bugs in the evening, not so much in the day, but in the evening, as soon as the sun sets, they come out, especially because everybody is huddled together in the food tent. A lot of people in our group actually forgot bug spray and were getting eaten up. So we highly, highly, highly recommend bringing a bug spray with you. One of our favorite pieces of gear was the dude wipe. This is what they look like if you're looking for them. You can find them at any Walmart or on Amazon. We'll talk a little bit about liners. I don't think it said anything in the brochure about them. A lot of people ask about that on the Facebook site as well. So we did bring our own liners, but we found out when we got there that they were provided. So that's a good thing to ask when you're at that meeting the night before. Just go ahead and verify if they're gonna have liners or not. We really wish that we didn't bring ours, but also their liners were a little bit strange. So we will say that. I'm not really sure what it was about them, the way they were shaped. They didn't quite fit in the sleeping bag. So your liner was almost tighter than your sleeping bag. So we felt very Kind of wound up getting tangled up in them every night. So one tip we came up with that we really didn't discover till around the third day was a sleeping bag trick. We went in the first week of May. So it was a little cold at night, I'd say in the upper forties and then hot in the day. Um, we had our thermals as well. So we were almost saying that we were a little too warm. So if you're one of those people who commonly sleeps on your side or on your stomach, uh, and it's a little bit harder for you to get sleep in a sleeping bag, we recommend this tip. We wound up putting our sleeping pads pretty close together and then sleeping on top of our sleeping bags as a little bit of extra cushion. And then we had actually brought a couple of extra blankets because we didn't know how cold it was gonna be. Again, this is just something you can buy off of Amazon for like 30, 35 bucks. Uh, super light and super compactable. And then we just laid that across both of us. So that way we were able to turn freely on our sides at night and get a little bit better sleep. Another item we think is really useful to bring with you is any size plastic bag. 
We usually bring a variety of quart size and bigger gallon size bags. This is really helpful to collect your trash, whether it's trash from something you eat or trash from going to the bathroom. That way you can keep it secure and concealed. Typically I would empty it out in the bathroom trash can each night or in a larger trash bag that our porters would carry. We give the Alpaca Expeditions four day, three night tour on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, five out of five Wilsons. Yeah, the trail was gorgeous. The food was amazing. Our guide was very fun and extremely knowledgeable. I genuinely think our experience would have been a lot different without him. So we'll go ahead and leave his information in the description below in case you want to inquire about requesting him to be your guide as well. Overall, we had an awesome time. We were challenged. We made some great friends along the way that we hope to see again someday and we highly recommend it. So we were talking to our guide on the trail about how scarce porters are becoming and how tourism is really exploding over there and Machu Picchu is becoming more and more commercialized. It's anticipated that the trail is going to look very different within the next 10 years or so. So if you've always wanted to do it, we recommend that you do it sooner than later. Thanks again for watching. If you found any of this information helpful, please consider liking and subscribing. And if you have any questions we didn't answer, please leave them in the comments below and we'll get to them as soon as we can.